Any particular challenges you're facing that I could support you on? Um, so basically, just to give you a little background, I've been studying for the past, I would say, eight months or so. Uh, I kind of started in the uh, high 140s range, um, and I've been able to get to the low 160s to mid 160s um, in that time, but I'm really trying to push to uh, 170 or higher. Um, I would ideally like to take the June test. I'm just kind of, I'm stuck in this rut where I'm kind of feeling lost. I don't know what area to really focus on. Uh, I think as of right now, Logic Games is probably my strongest. Uh, and LR, I am, I feel like my accuracy, here, but our time conditions, I tend to end up making mistakes uh, because when I'm doing it untimed, I get like one or two wrong. Um, and reading comp would be the one that I'm struggling with the most. Of course. Understood. Thanks for sharing the background. What is your pacing strategy like? Do you feel like you have a good pacing strategy in reading comp in particular? I don't think so. I kind of like, uh, there's times where I go in and I'm like, uh, this is what I'm going to do. But obviously like under time conditions, it gets, I get stressed out and I forget to do certain things and, uh, I feel like I'm kind of just going into it blind. Understood, of course. I mean, one of the most useful things you can have going into a timed setting is a clear step-by-step -step process. Every time I begin the reading comprehension section, here's what I do. When I first look at a passage, here's what I'm looking for. So I'd love to help you craft something like that so that going in, you can be laser focused, hyper aware of exactly what you need to be doing and you're not wasting any time. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, like I've been trying to focus more on the structure. Uh, I guess what I'm having trouble with is I, I noticing the patterns and just applying that when I'm actually taking the uh, time test. Um, because like when I'm just normally reading the passage under untimed conditions, I can kind of process and be like, oh, I've seen this before, this type of structure before, but it's really difficult to apply that when the pressure is on. Of course, of course, understood. Yeah, so having a structure in mind, knowing that these are the most common reading comprehension templates you'll typically come across, you can follow the flow of the passage without getting bogged down in the details, exactly. Have you attended any of the reading comp deep dive classes or watched any of the related videos? I've watched the videos. I haven't had a chance to attend the live sessions, but I was planning on that. Fantastic. Yeah, they're every Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern. And the approach is take one reading count passage in particular and go in depth analyzing it sentence by sentence, word by word, line by line, and looking for those key indicator words, and then talking on a meta level about what is the general path the author is taking in terms of how are they go going about making their argument. And in a general enough sense that you can easily link it with other passages doing the same thing. So I suggest taking what you've gained from those videos and those classes and then applying that mindset to when you're encountering a passage on your own. For sure. Another thing with reading comp that I find that I'm struggling with is uh, when I get to the questions, I always get out into two answer choices and I get confused between the two. And it's always that always happens. And um, I don't know what if it's my lack of understanding of the passage itself or just second guessing and the questions. So how do you have any suggestions on how to avoid that? Of course. Yeah, I mean, it comes back to the Socratic review method, which is a cornerstone of the course. We talk about it a lot in the logical reasoning context and the reading comp context. And so if you're switching your answer, you're not totally confident, there is always going to mean there's some kind of lack of understanding there. And so you got to drill down to exactly what about the question gave you trouble. Was it attempting wrong answer choice, an unappealing right answer? And then looking at, if so, what made the tempting wrong answer seem tempting and what ultimately makes it wrong? What makes the right answer seem unappealing, but what still makes it correct? It could just be the best of the worst and maybe elimination is the way to go. But lengthening your review process and deepening your review process, actually writing it out can often force you, give you some accountability to make sure that you're doing it. So have you applied anything like that to your studying? 
So, uh, yes, when I take a timed practice test, I usually, yeah, I do the, the test under time conditions completely like how I would do on test day. And then uh, I generally try to do a blind review the next day, but I reviewed the entire test. So I uh, t hide the answers. I basically take the test as I would untimed and see how I would do. So any anything that I'm even a little bit unsure about, I go in depth and I uh, have this, yeah, like this, uh, the review sheet that you have. Uh, I, I've been using that and I found that really helpful. I just don't know if it's worth it to go through the entire test again. I don't know if that's a waste of time, if I'm doing too much or. Yeah, that might take a little bit too long. It's a big obligation to put on yourself to redo the entire test, especially when you're aiming to take the LSAT in a month and a half or so, right? Mm -hmm. So I might think about instead of doing the entire thing, maybe just focus specifically on of course, the questions you got wrong, but also any that you weren't 100% confident in. So as you're going through the exam, you might make note of any questions where you weren't totally confident. If your confidence uh, rating on a scale of one to 10 was below seven, then maybe you want to make sure you look at that one again, regardless of what you ultimately chose. And then if you rate it eight to 10, then you're pretty good on it. And you can't choose seven because that's a cop out. It's too easy to <laughs> go in the middle there. So I'd say six and below, eight and above, everything six and below, look at that in depth and write out your review process for those. Okay. Um, and do you generally recommend the blind review strategy? Like uh, noting down the questions that I have trouble with and then uh, just looking at those ones after and then looking at uh, what I got on the test? I think it's useful in certain cases, but it's only part of the puzzle. You've actually got to articulate your review process and write it out. Ideally, I have the templates in the course going through that in depth. And it's a cornerstone of a lot of the classes we teach as well for both reading comp and logical reasoning. Games can look a little bit different sometimes, of course, because it's more mathematical. But anytime you have language and you have the ambiguities associated, you've got to talk through exactly what gives you trouble. In logical reasoning, could be the stimulus or a confusingly worded question stem, or of course the answer choices. But write it out or talk it out with a study buddy or a coach or something. We have study groups in the course multiple nights a week as well. And so that can help you feel like you're not going through it alone and get some pushback sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, as for uh, logical reasoning, um, like I said, I feel like my accuracy is there. Um, so what do you suggest that I should be doing in terms of LR prep? Should I be doing time sections at this point or should I continue to do untimed sections uh, until I feel like I'm even more confident? Well, you said you're already in the 160s, right? So you've already got the foundation. At this point, your weak areas might just be tough questions. It may not be about a certain question stem type at this point. So that's where really I suggest untimed work comes into the mix when you're doing a certain question stem type typically, or if you just want to focus on difficult problems exclusively. Like for example, doing the second half of a section where the difficulty level is increased, of course. But with the exam just over a month away, I would primarily focus on full length exams or individual timed sections. And then the untimed can be during your review. That can be your review process. Of course, you're, no one's timing you as you review things. In fact, if it takes longer, that might be a better thing. It might be better for you in the end to gain that understanding. So I'd primarily stick with time to this point, especially since you said timing's an issue and there could be some work to be done in pacing. I know we're talking logical reasoning now, but perhaps there's some carryovers. Uh, yeah, so I am planning on taking it in June, but also in case it, it, something happens, it doesn't go well. Uh, I also planning on taking it in August as well. Um, so I know the August one, it's going to be the full uh, LSAT. It's not going to be the flex anymore. So uh, do you suggest that I should kind of start prepping as taking the full test? Instead of That's a good question. We just had an internet connectivity issue for a minute, but I caught what you were saying. My recommendation would be that you decide which one is it for you and focus there. You don't have to have an it, of course, but 
you could prep for June like there is no August, knowing in the back of your mind that, hey, that could reduce the stress, knowing that it's not all riding on this one test date. You already have August registered. You plan to take that one as well. That's a great way to go. So I'd say prep for June like it's it, but also save a handful of exams to use for that potential retake if you plan to do it, of course. So maybe save a bunch in the 80s and or a bunch in the 70s to have as backups. Mm -hmm. I was planning on saving like five or six tests, just completely uh, blank that I haven't done at all, just in case June doesn't go well. Uh, because yeah, my GPA is on the lower side because I was working full time uh, throughout university in like a high management position. So I feel like uh, school kind of fell behind at that point. So I think, uh, yeah, I really just have to get ideally uh, at 175 or something. But yeah, I'm just, it's, it's really difficult to see how that's going to happen in a month. Uh, because uh, like I said, untimed, I'm able to, I'm able to get that 175. It's just a matter of, you know, pacing myself and uh, getting that under the time pressure and under time condition. Yeah, for sure. I believe you can get there. Of course, a month may not be enough time and that's fine. Do as much as you can between now and the June LSAT. Take that, take any lessons learned from taking that exam administration, getting a sense of what it's like with ProctorU, taking it in the online format, any work you do between now and then, of course, the pacing, the endurance, working on that, and then take lessons learned, apply them to August. You have another two months, significant room to grow during that time with uh, all the hours you can put in, all the practice material you can go through, and the strategies you can refine during that period as well. So uh, one more question. How many tests do you suggest that I should aim to take or how many tests per week? Well, you've got a good amount of time now. I mean, we've been saying a month, but it's really a bit more than that between now and June. It's because we're speaking in late April and the June LSAT's in mid-June. So maybe one a week, maybe two a week if you can. The question is not really the number of exams that you do. It's the depth of your review process completing those exams. So you said you were engaging in this in-depth review process, redoing everything. How many tests w were you planning to take per week? Well, I I started off aiming like at the beginning of April. I was like, okay, I'm going to take like one a week, and then I was like, that's too little. Uh, and at this time, since I'm I'm not working at the moment, I'm just focusing on studying. So I was planning on taking about three, but uh, the review process that I've been using takes so long that sometimes it's almost impossible to do three. So um, I think two might be better. Um, so I'm gonna really try to focus on that. Sometimes I get test anxiety even if I'm taking the practice test. So I kind of like push it. So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to do a time section instead. Uh, and I think that's where I'm really struggling too, that I just have to like do the test and not, it's just a practice test, but I get so much anxiety. So, yeah. I hear you. Yeah. You know, the anxiety is real and knowing that you have August as a backup can help, I hope. And then also knowing that you have plenty of time to take more practice tests and make test day like just another run through so using law hub practicing like game in the exact same look and feel because no one else is even allowed to replicate the exact look and feel the style the way it works and such in fact like in even in law hub like this was the the highlighter for example is a little bit iffy and yeah. that's going to be your experience so you want to be used to that and adjust accordingly maybe the highlighter is not for you for example but getting another even two exams a week under your belt between now and then can do a lot for you Okay, good to know. Yeah, I think, yeah, but even with LR, it's just, uh, I was kind of having trouble because I, I don't know what, I got to the point where I'm like, I don't know what question type to focus on anymore because I get the question type, I get this, but it's just the harder question. So I really like the idea of focusing on the last half of the exam rather than the first half because I tend to get everything uh, yeah, pretty much everything right from one to 15 or so. And then I start having a little bit of trouble. Awesome. Yeah. So definitely put that into practice and two exams a week will be more than enough. And it gives you some space to do some of those second half of logical reasoning drills.
just to work on tougher questions that you're more likely to have trouble with gives you more material for review. Okay, good to know. Fantastic. Well, it was really great connecting with you today. Before we sign off, what would you say is the biggest insight you got from our call? Um, I think, yeah, just the review process and uh, with reading comp and LR, what to focus on. And uh, I think with the reading comp, I was feeling like a little bit lost. So I think just, uh, I, I really, like, I, I don't think I was implementing the review process for reading comp correctly. So uh, I'm really going to try to focus on what you said and um, that focusing on what exactly in, in the answer choice is giving me trouble and what from the uh, passage itself didn't translate or what I missed. And I think that's going to be my biggest improvement, especially with reading comp and LR. Fantastic. I'm excited for you. Well, keep at it and I'll see you in class soon. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.